what is going on? I want to welcome you from Half Court for today, Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. I am one of your hosts, Sean Murphy, alongside Zarek Turner, a.k.a. Mr. Bully Ball himself, Zar. It's so good to see you, man. Thank you so much for being here. As we're recording, you're actually like just getting back from player exit interviews earlier today at the Performance Center. How was that experience, man? Pretty cool. Um, I think last year I did the exit interviews for Casey and Troy. And it was actually Casey's last press conference that I did before. Because I think it was um, it was after he had announced that, you know, he was stepping down and everything like yep. that. But they hadn't, you know, done the coaching search yet. So it was cool kind of being on the other side of things this year. Um, I thought it was pretty, pretty interesting perspectives. I... Um, some guys more than others, like I want, you know, some Simone um, seems like he's pretty locked in to stay based on the uh, answers he gave today, which was pretty interesting because I, yeah. I mean, obviously, like a lot of times with restricted free agents, it's kind of like, you know, you think you're going to come back or anything like that. But it seemed like they were pretty like he was like, yes, I want to be here. We're going to work on it. Da, 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 da. Like yeah. he went out of the way to say that. So that was interesting. And then like Kay talking about the extension and stuff like that. I'll have clips of. I, I tried to get the full interview. I have Stewart's full interview and I have like 99% of K's on my Twitter currently at yep. Zarek Xavier. Um, and then I'll, I still have to go through and edit a couple more, but I think I'll have um, Fontecchio and Durin up as well. Heck, heck yeah, man. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, with a guy like Fontecchio, you know, you trade for him in the, in the season, they didn't really give up much of, of anything for him at all. Like it was Kevin Knox and I believe like a second round pick, uh, you know, like, whenever you make that type of move, you, 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 you imagine that there's some conversations unofficially about, Hey, we'd love to, to keep you in the long term. So you don't, you'd imagine there's some form of understanding already, but you know, it's definitely good to hear that even when going through some of the difficulties, you know, of, of being here, he didn't really get to play much, you know, after, you know, being acquired from the deadline, the action he did have though. I mean, he was a solid contributor from when he was here. So definitely nice to hear that he wants to be here because Definitely a guy that Detroit would want to keep because uh, he was one of the few guys that could defend and hit threes, which is something that the Pistons need a lot more of. Absolutely. I think his uh, extension kind of became more of a reality, like more of a reality once he actually stepped foot on the floor. Because obviously I think like there was the initial Woj tweet when Quentin Grimes got traded here and they're like, Detroit views him as like a centerpiece. But like now you don't know for sure. Like, we think he'll be back, but it's not necessarily a guarantee. With Fontecchio, it's pretty much a guarantee that he'll be back this season. Grimes, I don't believe, is a free agent, but, like, you know, his future, you don't know if it's, like, certain here. Fontecchio seems like they really want to keep him around. And he seems like a really just good vibes guy because vibes yeah. are all important. He just seems like a good dude and um, seems to have, like, a great on-court chemistry with Cade he talked about that also like how much he loves playing with Cade and like how when he got here Cade was um had asked him like where he wants the ball and yep. no one had asked him that in the NBA yet so it was like it was just like a it was an interesting interesting thing to learn I'm really I'm, I'm really glad that um Fontecchio is getting that look um because he's a really solid NBA player I was vaguely familiar with him in Utah I don't watch yep. a ton of Utah admittedly um, but from what I did see, I always was like, oh, okay, he's interesting. And I remember he killed the Pistons in the game I actually covered against the Jazz, which was like that infamous 27th loss in a row. Yep. Um, where Cade, God, I felt bad for him afterward. Like not even as like, because at this point where I am now, I wouldn't really consider myself a fan anymore. You know, obviously it, I it's think no we'll always have rooting interest for the team in the, in our position is born. It was born out of fandom, but ultimately our job at this point is to report on the team. I think Correct. that's fair to say. Correct. Yeah. And like, plus just like, you know, the season didn't help either, you know, it was a kind of, kind of right. expedited process. Um, but, you know, I mean, I obviously on a human level though, just watching those guys go through that, I was like, Oh man, this, like, this is hard. Like, cause then I remember Cade walked through the door. Uh, cause you know how the press, the press room is. Yep. He walks through the door and like he his like eyes were like red. I was like, man. And he just was like, I'm sick right now. I was like, oh, like yeah. I felt so, you know what I mean? Like even if you're like the point is like even if you're not a fan of the Pistons or, you know, in general, like you see that you're like, damn, you know, 
Um, long story short, Fontecchio is a good piece, will be a good piece for the Pistons going forward. Um, Cade note aside. Yep. Yep. 100%. It, you know, it's, it, 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 and it, if you look at any of the silver linings, you know, it's that, you know, if there is any silver lining this season, it is how well Cade Cunningham played. I mean, he was, you know, absolutely phenomenal. I know today they talked a little bit about, you know, like the possibility of him, you know, like signing an extension. And it definitely seems like that's like on the, you know, on his mind, you know, for something this summer. In my mind, if there is any easy decision the Pistons have this offseason, it is signing that extension because, you know, assuming health, there is no reason to say that, you know, Kate Cunningham cannot be an all NBA caliber player or an all star caliber player at the very least based on his play. And, you know, the things that he's planning on working on, I mean, like the little things like his conditioning, once he gets to the point where he can play like on a more consistent level, 82 games a season or closer to that, I mean, that's going that in itself is going to improve the Pistons and, and put them in a better position in the long term. Absolutely. I hope. The hope is, in general, next season he doesn't have to kind of Superman his way through the season where yes. it all falls on him where it kind of did this season. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see where he's at compared to this past season because I know the stats aren't like a huge jump compared to, you know, the few games he played last season. But it was very evident if you watched past, like, his first stretch, like, from October to November – he was a whole different player this year. You know, like the the losing streak, you I actually saw him continue to improve. Like I remember that series where it was like Boston and then um, the Atlanta game. I was like, and then Brooklyn, I think as well. I was like, wow, like he's really taking a leap and they still can't win games. Yep. Uh, it was tough. It was tough to watch. It was really tough. But with a new president of basketball operations under you know, that search underway, I think he'll have a much better shot, yep. hopefully, at winning basketball games because his improvement is something that kind of is going to get forgotten about in this season. It just will because of how historically bad this team was. Yep. When you set the all time losing streak, people aren't going to remember oh do you remember the boston game though you know or like the the, the t- you remember the one time k dropped 40 like it's not what they're going to talk about about this season and yeah. it's unfortunate because he really did try his best to because he was coming off of pretty hard circumstances coming from injury and still recovering from injury you know throughout the season he did a lot and he he really was put in a tough position and uh i know he doesn't really shy away from being a leader and you know taking taking the uh the leadership role on a team like this but you got to feel for him a little you know yep 100 percent. now czar it's not very often that nba news breaks literally as as we're recording a podcast yeah um and i just noticed that uh woge and shams just both tweeted within the last minute announcing 11 of the 12 man Olympic roster for the uh, USA basketball this year. I want to talk a lot more about the Pistons, but I would be remiss because it's such a, like a gigantic roster uh, by by name value that I would be stupid to not bring this up. Uh, The following players are on this summer's uh, Olympic roster. LeBron James, Stephen Curry, Kevin Durant, Joel Embiid, Jason Tatum, Devin Booker, Drew Holiday, Anthony Davis, Anthony Edwards, Bam Adebayo, and Tyrese Halliburton. And the team is looking to currently keep one spot open. How do you even pick a 12th man out of when you already have like that level of, of quality talent? I mean, you know, the obvious when you're, when you're like from like the Pistons perspective, you know, like this time last year or like, you know, like, I mean, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Killian Hayes. He's gonna he's gonna he's gonna forego his French uh his French heritage to yeah. come step up for Team USA. No, uh like uh, like you know, from the business perspective, like last summer at you know, like Team USA Select, you know, Cade was out playing a lot of the guys that were you know like on this roster, and you think if the Pistons have a better season, you know, there's a shot that you know there's a conversation of Cade being on this roster. Uh, but you know, just just looking at the, looking at that as a whole, I mean that's that almost has like the like the ring of like modern day dream team kind of levels. 
Yeah, I was I was gonna say, is this like is this is this dream team worthy? Because I feel like I feel like it is. Yeah. Cause you got I mean it's not it's not every day where you get a team that has LeBron, Curry, KD, Embiid, Tatum, uh, Devin Booker, A D, Anthony Edwards, just like off the top, you know, and then that's yep. not including you guys like Bam, um, Drew Holiday, Halliburton, you know, like that's a stacked roster. Yep. And I'm really interested to see where the twelfth spot lands. Cause if I were to take a guess, I would think it might go to someone like Paulo, I yep. feel, because um he's kind of he he for he went to, you know, he could have gone with the Italian team, instead chose Team USA. Something to keep an eye out on. Big big controversy, by the way. Yeah, uh, you know, really, I, really Italy big. Was not happy. No, um, but it'll be interesting. I, 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 I will be tuned in absolutely for the Olympics. Um, I mean, if they don't get the gold, it's an all time, like, you know, like it's, it's, it is, it is an all time, like, you know, people are going to be shocked. It will be an all time embarrassment for oh, USA yeah. basketball. But the thing that I always look at when you have this type of stacked roster is like, who's the role player here? Who's the bench warmer? You know what I mean? Like who's, who's setting picks on this roster? Who's like, who's not taking the shots? I mean, it, I, the thing that's going to be really interesting, like Anthony Edwards before all this was like, well, I'm starting like, mm. you know, like I, I want to be the alpha on this team. You're going to have a room full of the alphas and Anthony Davis, but a room full of alphas. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But in all seriousness, like the greatest player, some of the greatest players in the history of the game. I mean, this is a this is a stacked room. So yeah. it's going to be it's going to be fascinating to see who like the, the wing stopper is who <laughs> like the guy who, who's the inbounder is. You know what I mean? Off the top of my head, I'm looking at the roster right now. Yep. I feel like you got to run a lineup of Curry, of course. Yep. And then it gets tricky because the two position do you go like a traditional two or do you roll out like three wings, you know? Yep. Cause if you roll out the two position, then I feel like it's really a toss up between Booker and Ant. Yep. I give it to Booker just cause you know, he's, he's the more experienced player, but I wouldn't, you know, I think that's a little closer of a conversation than some people want to have, but okay. Let's say it's like Curry Booker, Braun, KD and bead. And then you have Jason Tatum, Drew holiday, Anthony Davis, Bam out of bio, Tyrese Halliburton coming off the bench. That's ridiculous. Yep. Um, but I, what one thing I'm 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 wondering now, looking at this roster, it was 2021, summer of 2021, where like the 2020 Olympics happened, right? Yep. Is that going to go down as the worst Olympic basketball team that like Team USA has put out? Because I'm thinking off the top of my head, and no disrespect to Jeremy Grant, but like you had Jeremy Grant out there as as an olympian and now like you look at this in comparison and like the worst player and there's I, it's hard to say there's even a worse player but like it would be like maybe drew holiday at this stage of his career you know maybe yeah. like you know it's like it's really what the the drop off from tw like 2024 to 2021 is is insane because I, I if i'm remembering correctly it was like dame jeremy bam and like it was a lot of like it was no there was no lebron i think did kd was was kd part of that team uh i, I yes he was yep kd okay. kevin durant was the reason why they ultimately won that gold medal he was yeah. he was playing lights out um in in those olympics in japan but no, i it. i would right off the top of my head i i mean i would be inclined to agree like you know of of the teams that won the gold medal i would definitely agree um, right off the top of my head, I go to the 2004 team that won the, that won the bronze, um, which was like the reason that they, that they had to have the redeem team. But like, even yeah. then, like they had, I mean, they, they still had, uh, you know, they still had guys like Ray Allen. They still had Jason Kidd, but that year, uh, Kobe Bryant turned it down. Shaquille O'Neal turned it down, uh, and Kevin Garnett turned it down too. So yeah. I would say, I would say that that was probably, um, you know, like there, but even then, I mean, you look at it back then, it's like they had Carmelo, they had LeBron, they had Dwayne Wade, but like, that was like, they're literally like what, like year two in the league. Yeah. So like they're getting exposed by veterans out, you know, out, out in Olympic basketball, which is like sure. a lot, a lot different of a game oh, than NBA sure. basketball. Like it's for almost sure. a different sport. 
Yeah, I mean, you always like. I feel like people on Twitter kind of like under underplay how much uh, the rules change specifically because, like, a lot of times when the American players go and play internationally in the Olympics, they always complain about like the FIBA rules and they're like this is just not how we play basketball. Yep. Um, and I feel like people are like, oh, just get you. This is how real basketball is played. But like, there's really genuinely a, a difference and yep. and in play style. And, and rules and um i think it'll still be interesting though because like obviously team usa is the favorite right like it's right not really close but i would like to think that we're at a stage now where international basketball has never been stronger and i kind of wish Embiid wasn't on team usa for that i wish he was on yeah. france i wish yeah. we got the three-headed monster of Rudy i do Gobert, victor Wimbanyama, and Embiid, and, and throw him against the usa but like you know, it seems like this is kind of like the warrior situation where it's like, all right, well, it's it's just going to see who, who competes to get the silver medal. But like, yeah. you know, the one thing I'll say is this. You can't really overlook France in the sense that, you know, you talk about FIBA rules being different. You can't overlook, you know, Victor Wimbanyama already being that dominant defensively. Oh, yeah. yeah by the way, now we can swat balls like that are over the cylinder. Now that's a thing, by the way. Yeah. No, it'll be. <laughs> like, it'll, how it'll, is that it'll be... not? it'll be game. ridiculous but i think right now is kind of like that that 04 team you mentioned where yep. Wemby's like obviously he's great but yep. he's not going to be Wemby in the what 2026 olympics right oh my gosh yeah you know like that might be a completely different conversation and and considering i think i, I think mean 28 Alex, 28 or 28 it's every four years yeah Yep. Oh, okay. But every two years is the FIBA World Cup and international yeah, yeah. guys take it more seriously. So, he'll, yeah. so, he'll okay. play. so 2028. Yeah. This might be a whole different. This might be the best team Team USA can produce. You know, what I mean, like, because 2028 is LeBron still playing. I don't I mean, yeah. I hope so. That'd be great. But well, like bigger picture after this five, 10 years from now. Like it is not going to be nearly as 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 competitive as it is, because you look at the top 10 players in the league. Eight, like what? Like seven of them are international. Yeah, I mean, you think of it like uh, off the top of my head: Giannis, Luca, Jokic, Embiid. Yep. Uh, um, Even Shea's Canadian. Shea is technically Canadian. Yeah. Um, it's it's a it's a it's becoming an international game, which is great. Yep. And I think this is something for fans that, especially American fans, enjoy this moment genuinely and i don't mean that in like a, a in a funny way i mean genuinely enjoy this moment because we might not get it again or at least for a long time where america really has like a powerhouse basketball team it will like never this. be this dominant again i feel comfortable saying that yeah because of the game i mean you even look at like pistons fans right now are are if they're looking at the draft they're looking at like alex Sar, right yep correct me if i'm wrong alex Sar is out of france right mm-hmm you know what I mean? Like, this is just yet another draft where it's an international guy at the top of the list. Last year was Wemby. And then even if you look at guys like, minus his whole situation, but even guys like Josh Giddy, you know what I mean? Like, the fact that, like, guys like that go, like, sixth in the draft and they still are really, like, lasting in the league says yep. a whole lot. Like, it's not the 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 Frank Nielakinas, no disrespect to him, not the Frank Nielakinas of the world. And, like, I know, it's, you know what I mean? Like, um... The it's quality changing. of the international game is is improved so much that you're not like these guys aren't coming in like as nearly as much of projects anymore. Like these are yeah. like 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 a guy like Josh Getty, you know, like like you said, say what you will about a situation, but he played legitimate professional basketball that like made him ready to be a legitimately good player when he came in. Absolutely. And like you can almost argue that that experience is becoming more valuable than what you're getting in college because of the way that the college games diminished over sure. the, over years. For sure. Um, my one hope with this Olympic roster, because I don't want to get too far off because we because there yeah. are a lot of pisses yeah. stuff to talk about. But my biggest hope with this Olympic roster is that we get a uncut, like like all access footage the way we did with the last dance, where you have these camera crews, and I'm talking like the pickup games, I'm talking the practices, because when I think of like what intrigues me about this summer, like number one on the list is going to be the competition between Devin Booker and Anthony Edwards for that starting two spot. You know, those guys are going to be going at each other every single day in gym. And I need to see at least one of their one-on-one -on -one games, like at least one. So like, 
like don't drop the ball like we did back in the day or we somehow don't have footage of like those incredible dream team scrimmages that we hear like you know that that we hear parables about like get this on film so that we can make money please like i will watch it as soon as it's available i'm not gonna lie to you there's absolutely zero chance not one of netflix disney or hbo have already secured the rights to this because like there is a hundred percent a documentary coming along 100 percent. you know like there's just that well, there's no I, way that this isn't announced and like i mean lebron steph curry kevin durant like Le- at least like two of those guys like one of their at least two of their production companies are already working on something but yeah nonetheless it's gonna be like that's just huge news so we had to talk about it uh yep. nonetheless other big news that dropped earlier today and you alluded to it earlier is uh per sham sharania the detroit pistons have ultimately decided after a 14 and 68 i will uh repeat it again 14 and 68 season uh the detroit pistons have decided to hire a new head of basketball operations aka a president and will begin their search process this week now this will be their first president since stan van gundy in 2019 when uh when he uh traded the boat to get blake griffin uh in exchange for uh tobias harris and and a collective of things um it's gonna be an interesting couple of weeks are and you know it's uh I, I know that you I know you have some thoughts on, you know, like what direction they're going to go and, you know, like what potentially could happen. Um, you know, first first gut reaction when you saw that news today. Gut reaction expected. I, mm-hmm. I like I mean, if you keep up, you saw James kind of point at this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then I think there was even an Omari piece that came out either earlier today or yesterday. I want to say yesterday. It was yesterday, the last yep. game against the Spurs. Um, Vince Goodwill went on Pistons Live and, and yep. broke down, you know, yeah. that this was likely coming. And it's actually Vince Goodwill who kind of, if you, ah, man, what was the podcast? I would love to give the podcast a shout out. Can't remember off the top of my head. I remember he was on a podcast once and he said something along the lines of like, when you start hearing something a lot, that thing's probably already like happened. Like it's, yep. you know, I mean, like it's, and it's, um, it's a thing where like, if you read the tea leaves, it's pretty, you can, you can connect the dots. Um, yep. And one thing I heard, I heard about the president of basketball operations right around the time, I think the first James piece dropped. And then I was like, okay, like this is probably going to be the direction everyone's waiting on the, a lot of Pistons fans, I should clarify, are waiting on the Monty Williams is stepping down as head coach news or, you know, the Troy Weavers getting fired news. I think that actually. Let me correct myself. From what I understand, um, this president of basketball operations will have the authority to make those decisions, but I don't expect those decisions to be made until there is a president of basketball operations who will very likely want to have his own GM and front office staff at the bare minimum, let alone a new coach slash, you know, yep. Coaching, coaching tree that, that follows. I think if Monty remains after the president of basketball operations, you know, kind of, goes through his off season and everything. If Monty is still here opening night, it's because the president of basketball operations, whomever they hire believes in Monty Williams. It's not because they feel pressured to keep Monty because from what I understand, Tom is willing to eat that contract. It's more so just now genuinely at this point, it's on the president of basketball operations to make the decision on Troy Weaver to make the decision on Monty Williams. So those are two big things um, that'll, that'll, that are something to keep an eye on. They both could stay, you know, who knows, Yep. but it's also very plausible that both end up kind of parting ways with, with, with the Pistons, especially considering how, and I cannot understate how badly this season went, you know, cause mm-hmm. A season like this, one season like this is terrible, but 
really two seasons in a row of this is flat out un like almost unbelievable. I know Monty wasn't the coach last year, but the fact that you did worse than last year and last year you're like, oh my God, we won 17 games. We can never do that again. And you, you, you win less. Well, and the talk was we were without our number one overall pick. We were without, Correct. you know, our, with, with the guy who stirs the drink, you know, if he's yeah. here, we, we get more wins. Well, yeah. you know, you had the wrong direction after going and getting the, the top coach on the market. And, you know, you, you also talk about connecting the dots and connecting the tea leaves. This isn't, you know, what I have isn't sourcing, but what I have is, you know, just a memory. Right. And that is this time last year, after going through the season that the Pistons did, there was a letter, uh, an infinite, a now infamous letter that was, you know, released by Troy Weaver to the fan base. Real quick, I just want to read it just because, you know, I, I because I, I think it's a pretty significant moment, you know, like at least in the history of Pistons fans. And so, yeah. especially with how the season went, where we are now, I think it's just interesting to look back on. So, this is from Troy Weaver addressing the fans last season. It says, quote, when I made the decision to do, to join the Detroit Pistons franchise in June of 2020, it was a great appreciation and understanding for what this organization means to the city, its fans, and all those who bleed red, white, and blue. I know the history, I know the tradition, and I know the urgency to which our fans want to win and see us move back up the ladder of, NBA's, of the NBA's hierarchy. Our focus is aligned with yours, and from the top down, we are committed to delivering on this restoration process for you. Rebuilding a team does not always follow a, a linear path. And we experienced that this year with the injury of Cade Cunningham that forced them to miss a majority of the season. Leaning on that, I think, is something that people are going to look back on and go, well, that's no longer a catalyst, right? Um, mm -hmm. While that injury impacted the, the continuity of our team, it also presented an opportunity for growth of others. Overall, our players had overwhelmingly embraced the core principle of going to work and competing every night. We are in an excellent spot to upgrade our roster this offseason. We are posi we positioned ourselves for another high draft choice in this year's draft. We have a favorable salary cap position and we'll continue to talk with teams and evaluate trade opportunities as they present themselves. Make no mistake, we are all disappointed with our record this season, but are confident that we continue to be on the right path to success. We appreciate your patience, trust, and loyal support as we continue this journey together. You deserve the opportunity to celebrate this team once again as a fixture among the NBA's best, a bedrock to this city and its culture. We are partners with you in building greatness together. Troy Weaver. Oof. And looking back at that, you know, it's, it's knowing it's, it's really just knowing what precedes it, right? Because you talk about the things with, you know, the salary cap space, which, it, which was true, was a, was a asset of theirs at the time. But when they ultimately kicked it down the road, you kick that proverbial can down the road again, you know, I think that starts to raise, you know, those eyebrows and those questions. You know, I think obviously a lot of people do believe, you know, like if Kate Cunningham, you know, is healthy, they're a better team. But we saw this year that doesn't necessarily equate to a better record. And I think, in, I think in retrospect, you know, I, I, I understand being confident in the people and, and in who you bring in house. But I think just that, that lack of, uh, urgency ultimately to actually go and upgrade that roster from where it was last year going into this season. Like, don't get me wrong. Like they went and got guys, but they were not nearly the type of firepower they needed to actually take a step, let alone even maintain. Um, so, you know, I, I would just love to hear your thoughts after hearing that, you know, kind of your takeaways. Um, but but For the one. ultimate point I was going to make really quick, I'm sorry, yeah. I just remember yeah, the dots I'm connecting here is this time now, we haven't heard anything from Troy. And I think when you look at the situation, you look at why. It's because if you look into if you connect the dots, look into what you're saying, it's probably because it, his, his future here depends on who is actually going to be making that decision. Correct. And. I. Well, first of all, I I feel like I'm reading a freezing cold takes tweet when when you when when you read that out. It did not age well on pretty much any level, especially yeah. because of how much Troy emphasized the cap space and you know primed to get a high draft pick and then he fell. Um and then going out and really having excluding the Monty hire 
because I guess that techn- that to me that doesn't technically count as a roster move. Right. Having the least aggressive offseason imaginable after a letter like that where you acknowledge that how the season didn't go the way it is, but guys, listen, there's more to come. We are going to we're going to turn this around. Don't worry. And then you kind of don't do anything. You know, like you trade for Joe Harris, but you don't trade anything for Joe Harris. You trade for Monte Morris, but you trade like a, what, second round pick for Monte Morris. And then, yes, you draft Asar Thompson. Yes, you draft Marcus Sasser. You traded your 30th overall pick for Marcus Sasser. So let's just say that you essentially use that pick, right? Mm-hmm. What did you do? You know, because Joe Harris barely played for you this season. And when he did, it was like the ghost of Joe Harris. Yep. And Monte Morris had the mysterious injury that that continued to to evolve until eventually he made his debut and then very shortly after was traded. Yep. And you look at all of that. You look at the losing streak. You look at how when the losing streak happened, everyone was like, okay, we're going to do something. We're going to do something. It wasn't until... Was the Wizards trade after the, the losing streak or in the midst of the losing streak? Like so the, the Wizards, uh, so the Wizards trade was it was after the losing streak, but okay. um, it was I, I would say it was like about like you know like a couple weeks into January. I would say it's quite a while after that streak started, and yeah. it felt like from an outsider's perspective, because obviously I'm not in the front office or anything. And I think a lot of fans felt like there was a lack of urgency in the midst of this losing streak. And cause, cause the thing with the losing streak is you could tell by the third game of that losing streak, not the 20th, the third game of that losing streak, something is very wrong with this team. There was something that is, seriously not clicking and it's not the fact that boyan's not back yet and it's not the fact that alec burks went out there was something genuinely wrong but for some reason this front office had this belief that okay when these guys come back from injury and it was the same exact mindset that doomed them last season where it's like okay well if cade wasn't injured then this would be different yeah injuries happen it's basketball if if, 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 this we'd all be drunk yeah exactly in any sport Injuries are destined to happen. It is the name of the game. Yep. Your job as a front office, your job as a coaching staff, and your job as you know a player who's stepping up is to do exactly that. Step up when injuries happen. Pivot when injuries happen. The greatest skill you can have in anything is to roll with the punches. Yep. Because... Everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. Guess what? In anything you do, you're going to get punched in the mouth. Nothing ever goes completely according to plan. And if your plan depends on the calves of a 35-year-old Boyan Bogdanovich, your plan was doomed to fail in the beginning. Right. And they went out this, this deadline and traded half the roster, sold them off for whatever they could. I would say you got back one and a half good assets in Fontecchio and the idea of Quentin Grimes. Yep. I still believe Quentin Grimes can be a valuable piece of this team, but you haven't seen it yet. He's really only played so, like what, like three games in a Pistons uniform Four? I think, I think six, six yeah. games and really yeah. only was healthy. I still looked healthy for like that next game. Yep. So you look at all that and you look at, and we have to address it, the 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 fan interaction, right? And the crowd where, you know, the, that, that whole debacle, and for those who don't know, Troy was allegedly getting, like, you know, trash talk by a fan. From what I've heard, it was nothing outrageous. Yep. He was, he was definitely annoying, for sure. The fan seemed like he was really getting on Troy's nerves. But Troy has this big explosion. He goes, oh, you know, I'll, you're lucky. Do you have the bleep button ready? Yep. You're, like, you're lucky I don't come right down and beat. And, the, <laughs> you know, and then, and you see that because there's a video of it and you see that and you're like, 
this guy my initial thought was this guy must have said something crazy he must have said something. it was very cool. out of character for troy Weaver. yeah but then i keep reading reports because i had no in, insight or knowledge really of the situation so i'm really depending on other people's reporting not reporting obviously myself just you know for my own um information i'm just looking and i'm like fan said okay didn't say anything crazy and from the video all you can hear him say is you're terrible at your job you're so bad at your job yep and what that tells me is that troy reacted that way because when you know that there's some truth to something or you feel a little insecure about feel something the heat. you're more likely to snap yeah and especially if you don't think your job security is totally safe i mean he 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 can read the tea leaves and you know he knows as much as anybody when you're in when you're in that type of situation when anybody's in that type of situation their job isn't safe it actually reminded me a lot i'm not sure if you remember this but it was when steve nash was coaching the nets there mm. was a particular game i think it was like in phoenix or something where um he got ejected and he just was like going at it with the refs and like he was literally having to get like held back by his by his like assistant yeah. coach and staff you remember that actually yeah and it's like it was so like like you see it with almost any other coach and you know it's it's like oh well you know jason kidd had a, had a rough night but it's yeah. like when it's a guy like steve nash who's so zen who like he's known for being the nice guy like you've never seen him yell in your life and then all of a sudden he has to be held back like you know a very similar situation of not performing up to the expectations, you know, being, you know, being in a situation where, you know, it's very clear his, his job is on the line. And, you know, like I, 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 I it made me think of that. And, you know, honestly, like my, I, I definitely think, you know, I, I don't think Troy's future was, well, or in, in that decision will be based on that moment, no. but I definitely think it's like, you know, that being the last public look that he'll have this season more than likely and possibly as the Pistons general manager. I mean, it's, it's a rough look to go out on for sure. For sure. Um, and then I just also wanted to add this on the whole president of basketball operations thing. Um, Cause this will probably come out. I mean, when, 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 when is this probably going to drop? I generally release it on like Wednesdays. Okay. So it'll probably be out by now, but in case it's not, or if it is, who knows, but what I've heard in terms of candidates, as far as two early favorites, and I'm talking very early, obviously, because the hiring search doesn't officially begin until tomorrow. Yep. But from what I understand, um, John Horst of the Milwaukee Bucks is yep. a very strong candidate. I actually, I saw Mark Stein also report that. And then another one I was made aware of was Bryson Graham who I believe is currently with New Orleans. Okay. Yep. Um, those are two names to keep an eye out for. Obviously, I'm sure the list will grow. Yep. But as far as early favorites, because I do believe they want to make a hiring decision sooner than later. Yep. So they can just kind of get stuff rolling. Um, Especially I, I, when they have to make other decisions on exactly. other places. Exactly. Like, yeah. This isn't like a coaching search where you let it roll out for a little longer. Like 100%. you have to be, you have to be confident in who your decision maker is going to be. Absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there that those, those are, those are a couple names that, that I've heard thrown around and those names I've heard thrown around the most. Yep. I, and I think those names make a ton of sense. So looking at like the potential candidates, I know you mentioned, you know, like John horse. And I think when you look at like the ones that, that kind of make the most sense, the ones, you know, if you're to look at like the Vegas money line, he probably is like the most likely and, and on paper, just, you know, like the most obvious choice in the sense that you've seen what he's done right inside, you know, like right inside your division, you know, he, he he's originally from Sandusky. So he's from Michigan. Um, but you know, like at, at the same time, you know, at the, you know, this time last year, Charles Lee was the, was the original front runner for the Pistons head coaching job. So um, anything can happen. These are just, you know, initial names, but I mean, you, you look at the, the culture they have, you know, in Milwaukee and, you know, just the, the record they have of building a really solid roster around Giannis 
you know, mm-hmm. that's definitely the type of name that would give you intrigue to see what he could do, you know, to build around a Cade Cunningham. Absolutely. Um, I, I think he's, he's a name to watch. I, I, I also heard Bryson Graham from, from New Orleans, who's uh, yep. on the younger side. I, I have to do more of my own independent research because I, I just get told names, really. Um, but from what I understand, he's got a pretty impressive resume pretty early on into his career. I don't believe he's 40. And if he is 40, he just turned 40. Yep. So the age, I feel like, kind of aligns with um, the, the timeline of this team and everything like that. And I think just having younger voices a lot of times can be um, – Interesting, and I think it can be progressive in terms of how you approach basketball, how you approach philosophies, how you approach hiring, how you approach, you know, things like that. I think when you have younger voices in there, it's a lot more likely to be at least malleable, you know, like the, you're, you're more open to change. Yep. Um, so I think, I think if I were to say one of those two, I would, I would lean towards Bryson. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just, I, I feel like, you know, it'll be interesting though to watch. Cause obviously we don't know anything yet. The interviews haven't even happened yet, but those are just yep. two early names. I've, I've heard one name and this isn't something I've heard. Um, this is again, pure speculation. I had tweeted this earlier, pure speculation, Yep. but uh, Tim Conley, Yes. The Timberwolves president is, as Shams Charania, he has an opt out in his contract. And there's the whole ownership thing between, <clears throat> sorry, Alex Rodriguez and current ownership. Very and, much not a small thing, by the way. That is no, huge. It's a very big thing, and it happens to affect stability. It happens to affect a lot of people's salaries because from what and ex- what's the, what's the current Timberwolves owner's name I'm completely blanking I know it um I I am blanking on it as, let me look it up really quickly I I should I should know this too um I, I know I know he was claiming that that Alex Rodriguez and his ownership group was going to plan on un, was to plan on going in under the cap Plenty next year right. yeah um um but I, I also a uh, Glenn Taylor. Yeah. Yep. Glenn Taylor. So he, so that's his claim. But at the same time, Glenn Taylor's literally never spent when he was the owner of the Timberwolves. And that's kind of the, you know, part of the reason why they've been so historically bad for so long. So like, and, and they're about to be a team that enters the second apron, which, you know, as of the day, as of like when this recording today's the day that starts to matter. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's no longer something you can just look off on. That's a reality now. So, yeah. so stability kind of plays a huge factor, obviously. Yep. Right now in Detroit stability. When you're not the best team in the NBA, isn't like secure, but I've never heard a executive who works here or has worked here kind of say bad about the stability of ownership you know what i mean yep. um <clears throat> i think there's cultural things that need improving but a president of basketball operations can kind of help shift the culture yep and i think that it could be an appealing job for someone like tim conley if and only if he's looking at the situation in minnesota right now and going okay, I did my job here. I'm not sure if this is going to be a staple job for the next few years. And I would like to have a staple job and also kind of get to <clears throat> do a thing where I kind of mold my own roster again, you know, yep. that type of thing. Then yes, um, I would say Detroit might be an appealing job. Yep. However, it's also very likely that he just remains in Minnesota because they're great right now. Yep. And it's a result of his work. Yep. And Anthony Edwards is like 23. Would be exactly. really hard to leave that. Exactly. So it's not an easy situation to leave. The only reason it really is a discussion is because of the turmoil with ownership that like maybe yep. that's um maybe that's something that that plays a factor. 
and Again, when you speculate is, too, like exactly. sorry to cut you off, like you look yeah. at you look at Tom Gore's, he goes after the big names. He goes yeah. for the swing. Yeah. That's what he wants. And um, you know, like like you can say whatever you want about Tom Gore's, and he's certainly not been a perfect owner. You know, like his record and and you know the 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 results speak for itself. Yeah. But it has never been from a lack of him wanting to to turn it around, or it's definitely never been a lack of him spending. We, yeah. we definitely know that. Yeah, I mean, and and that's the thing. Like, it's I mean, that's also something you want to be weary of, though, is because of like the whole Monty Williams situation. Because yep. again, we'll see how it plays out this summer, or even the next few months or next month. Um, but that situation right now, we can we can say that's a failure because you achieved the worst record in team history right and the worst losing streak in nba history one away from the worst in american sports history um so it's it's a thing of do we go after the name or do we go after the fit because i feel like last year they were and i mean they i mean tom tom was and he takes he takes responsibility for the money hired he would take response he took responsibility for when it was hired obviously troy played a part too but it was mostly a, a Tom thing and he, he really put his name on that. So now that's still his name is on that. So it's also kind of a failure on his name. Yep. However, if he's still someone who's very enticed by big names, big resumes, that you got one right there. But also in kind of the same vein, not as big of a name, but um, like I had mentioned, John Horst, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 2021 executive of the year, right? Mm-hmm. Um, big resume. So I, I, I think that'll be something to, to, to keep an eye on. I think the Bryson Graham choice would be more unconventional based on how Tom typically goes about things. Because I mean, if you even think about before Troy, the last president of basketball operations, because Troy was GM, but last president of basketball operations and head coach was Stan Van Gundy big name yep. Dwayne Casey the coach that followed him big name the coach that followed Dwayne Casey Monty Williams big name so it'll be interesting to see if that's something that continues because if yeah. it doesn't and you look at someone if not Bryson Graham someone like Bryson Graham who's smaller name but a lot of potential interesting ideas good philosophy and you think he can shape your basketball team into a winner that'll be interesting to watch so it it should be interesting to see if tom has changed the way that he approaches things because he's the one that's going to be conducting these interviews yep if he's the one if he's changed the way he approaches how he's thinking about things in terms of name versus fit or resume versus potential resume stuff like that I, i i think um will be interesting to watch for sure. Yeah, without a doubt. And, you know, from there, whenever that hire is made, that's going to give, you know, a lot of implications on, you know, philosophically where Detroit's going to go, what type of team we're going to be looking to build, you know, who's going to be, you know, a part of that process and namely who's not going to be, you know, a part of that process. Right. And I mean, this, this doesn't even begin to, you know, unravel the the potential of, you know, what players will be here, what players will ultimately not be here, you know, like even, uh, you talk about like, you know, out like, you know, Alex Sar, like, you know, like who the Pistons could draft this upcoming off season. There's a conversation of, are the Pistons even going to keep the pick? You know, like, like nothing is off the table for, you know, like for where the, the Pistons are right now, except, except keeping things as is, that is the only thing that is off the table. So, um, you know, I, I definitely think the timing of the move is, is definitely the right one in the sense of going after the president of, of basketball operations. And I mean, you know, again, as you said, it, it is just going to be fascinating to see how it unfolds. And I think we're going to learn a lot about, you know, like what their approach is by what hire they make. So. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it'll be, it'll be something to watch. And I think the process will be relatively quick. Obviously it's not going to be like, okay, they hire someone tomorrow, but I think it's not going to be nearly as long as the coaching search was. Yep. I would imagine they would probably want to have them as the representative at the lottery. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So yeah, they would probably want someone, you know, before, so it's not contingent, contingent on where they land in the lottery. 
that too. Not that not that this year's draft is going to make that decision. There's no this, victor that's depending. Yeah, if this was last year, that would that would make or break that. Which yeah. uh one last thing about that, you know, like we I I think you know, as we are kind of doing a retrospective on like last season and like I've, I brought this up briefly before, but it's like, you know, I don't think we talk about like the significance enough of that Pistons fall from one to five, and yeah. like the consequences of that. Um, I don't think people realize like it's not hyperbole that it was the wor- the biggest fall a team has had in the history of the draft lottery. Like no team has fallen out of the top three or even the top four before let alone to get to the top five and for it to be that class in particular. Now, don't get me wrong. Asar Thompson looks to be a, a phenomenal player in his own right. You know, already we could be looking at him literally in a year or two as an off defensive type player, like a lot to like there. Yeah. But the consequence of that fall and the season that ultimately turned out after it. And I know it's impossible for Pistons fans to not look at the highlights on social media and, you know, and, and, and what Wimby has already done and right. what he could be and think about the, what if it almost just feels like, you know, this, this organization almost like never fully reconciled with what that meant and never really took the urgency to try and fix that, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, we look at the off season, right, where they did nothing essentially. Victor or Scoot or Brandon Miller um, walks through that door for the for their um, press conference, and you know they give him the jersey and everything, and it's at the performance center. That's what they had in mind. They did not have in mind. We're going to get the fifth pick because, like you said, it's never happened before. And I remember a quote from Troy um, on the day after the lottery, I want to say it was. Because I was in the room and it was something along the lines of like they had asked him about, you know, dropping and, you know, if that changed how they were planning on things. And he said, like, he learned how to make a nickel into a dollar or something. It was something along the lines. Yeah. I'm sure you yep. could hear saying something yep. like that. Um, and I think that's a great quote, but that nickel turned into a penny, you know, um, it's not, it's not the real philosophy of how they really approach things. And if we're going to be completely honest, if Victor Wembenyama was a Detroit Piston and they had went into the off season with the plan of, okay, we're going to have Cade and Victor alongside Ivy and Duran. Then you would have been able to skate by with a Joe Harris, Monte Morris thing. And you would have been like, okay, like we got to see how the, the young guys play first, right? right. Like we got to see how they play before we make any decisions on, cause now you just added, cause the thing about Asar, he's a great piece to have, but he's a piece, right? He's also a project. And a project as well. Victor Wembanyama is a pillar. That is a pillar of your team the minute you draft him. The same way Cade Cunningham is a pillar of your team the minute you draft him. And when you have two pillars like that, you have to let them kind of develop that chemistry. I still think you could have benefited from going out and getting you know veterans that fit them better. Right. If I've gotten Victor. But then I, I wonder this question a lot. Would Victor be in the same position had he come to Detroit as he is right now? Because it's easy to say, oh, Victor would be Victor anywhere, right? But when you think about it, the beginning of the season, they had him playing with Zach Collins, right? Yeah. And then they were like, okay, well, that's not working. We're going to put Victor at the five. Monty Williams is a very and not to say pop isn't but monty I mean, is Pop's very, one of the best coaches in the history of the oh, sport of and course, monty, of monty had basic uh basic adjustments that would that that would make you scratch your head so i think there's a lot of validity in that point yeah because i was gonna say not not that pop isn't stubborn but monty is very stubborn as we saw with the whole Jaden ivy killian hayes thing like 
I don't know for sure if Victor would have had the season that he had with the Detroit Pistons. Cause you know, like it's completely possible. They really just, let's say they were trying to do the, the Cleveland Cavaliers thing where they did Victor Stewart and Duran. Cause I totally could have seen that happening. And if that wasn't working, I don't think they would have changed or pivoted until like it was way too late. And I think Victor's averages, right? I mean, he ended the season, what, like 21.6 points per game, right? Mm -hmm. Might end up averaging like 16. That's a five point differential. You know what I mean? Like it's right. I, I, I don't, I can't say I'm as confident that Victor would have been what he is now. So I guess for his sake, great for him that he landed in San Antonio. Um, but retrospect, like looking in retrospect, I don't know if, if Detroit actually would have been the best fit. Cause obviously like, you know, in San Antonio, obviously they need a point guard. They, that's like the number right. one. Right. That, and that Tom- would be the argument for why it would have exactly. possibly worked. Right. Exactly. But the thing here is we are very big on the double big thing, not to say Stewart and Duran don't work. Cause I actually think this is a hot take. I'll, I'll, I'll do this here. I think Stuart and Duran fit better than Cade and Ivy. But I think that's fair. Yeah, but I think they would have probably tried to do Wemby, Stuart, and Duran. You know what I mean? And then that, without I just, a doubt. And I I don't I don't think that would have worked, but I think they would have really, really, really tried it. And I think that might have hampered his development. So I don't know. Cause it's like it's one thing if you have a coach who's like, okay, this isn't working, we're gonna just go and do this. Monty's not that guy. Yeah, just I mean, we can say that he he didn't start killing. He didn't start Ivy over Killian until like two weeks before Killian was waived and out of the NBA completely. And then how much longer until Ivy was even like a primary ball handler in in sets? Exactly. And then how long until Kate and Ivy were staggered? It didn't happen, really. You know, like it, it, it very rarely happened if it did. It's just it's it's a it's a unique stubbornness that I think hampered the development of this team this season. And I think it would have hampered the development of Victor Wembanyama as generational of a prospect as he is. You're not immune to yep. coaching. Yep. And and now you bring in the guy who's going to have the definitive autonomy in your franchise to say this is who's playing. This is who's not. Because Let's be honest, when Monty got that bag, the power dynamics in the organization changed. It did. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just a fact of the matter. And like, obviously everyone says the, the, the cooks in the kitchen thing. And yes, there is a lot of voices that have sway in Mm -hmm. Piston's organization. That's just a fact. Yep. They have gone on record admitting that. I think that changes with the president of basketball operations, not to say that all of those names who sway things will be gone, just that there will be less sway, you know? So maybe if Victor was in this year's draft, he'd have a, you know, that'd be a different conversation, but he's not. And good for him that he's had the season he's had in San Antonio and that he's pretty much run away with rookie of the year. They're, I've just accepted they're just gonna they're gonna put someone insane around him this summer, oh, and then they're oh, gonna like they're somehow gonna make it to like the Western Conference Finals. It's not gonna, gonna, yeah, it's not gonna be long. Yeah, not at all, not at all. If I'm uh if I'm San Antonio, I'm looking at what what's happening with Donovan Mitchell. Is all I'm saying. I'm waiting to see how Cleveland does. Absolutely, and uh, and you're looking. I'm I mean I'm even looking at Atlanta with Trey Young or Dejounte Murray. You know, one of those guys makes a big difference and something i was actually talking with my dad about was and this is something i guess maybe if i don't know how much more time we have probably not much but i wanted to hit on this yeah the the nba in 2000 like the late 2010s seemed to be moving away from the big man, right? Like, it's like yep. oh, it's going to the small ball. And then we've gone the complete opposite direction, right? Yep. When you look at each championship team um, from, let's say, 2019 onwards, that was, 2019 was five years ago now. Yep. Which is crazy. But 2019, 
you think about the Toronto Raptors, obviously Kawhi, Kyle Lowry, OG, Pascal, Marcus but they had, but they, exactly, they had really, 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 really exceptional big play with Marcus All, Serge Ibaka. Yep. Then you look at 2020, Anthony Davis, right? Then you look at 2021, Giannis, Brook Lopez. 2022, um, I guess you could make an exception. But even then, I, I think Kevon Looney deserves a little more credit than he gets. Well, hey, do you see that Drummond footage? In the, in, do you see that Drummond footage? He, he's going to add that three-pointer to his game this season. He, it's coming. Drummond <laughs> breakout year. It's happening. Um, but I, I'll, I'll exclude 2022, right? Because like I'm talking just like exceptional bigs. Kevon Looney is exceptional in his role. I just, you know, you know what I mean? Yep. And 2023, Nikola Jokic. And by all means, 2024 could be Jokic again. So my question is, we always look at like franchise guys and we look at who is your best player on a championship team. And for the longest, we said it's wings because of guys like LeBron. And yep. um, before that, it was like Kobe and, you know, Jordan before that. And it's like, I'm at the point now where I'm actually wondering, is a franchise big who is truly exceptional more important than like a franchise wing yeah because because I'm, I'm thinking and i'm like who who who's gonna guard victor right and yep. in, in a playoff series when he's like in his prime you yeah. know right and that's the interesting thing too because to your point I, I i think when you look at the history of the game there is nothing more surefire dominant than like a truly great big right and i think now we're just seeing the evolution of that because it's like we saw like the dominance of small ball of like of like the small ball uh, era and the Warriors and their ability to shoot. The only thing that's going to beat like, you know, dominant, you know, like like small guys who can shoot are big guys who can shoot <laughs> and like and keep up in just about every other respect. So, you know, I, I definitely you know, you look at Steph Curry and, you know, he's probably like looking around at guys like Wemby, like, what have I done? What have I created? Because, yeah. you know, the amount that he's really extended the you know, the three point line and the importance of, of having that shot as, you know, to your point, like Brooke Lopez was never even thinking about, you know, looking beyond the elbow, like Al Horford completely transformed, transformed his game yeah. and, and moved beyond, moved beyond the perimeter as well. And so like, to your point, I think we're definitely going to still see like a myriad of those types of bigs. Mm -hmm. I think where you're still like, where the wings and like those types of guys are still going to have a ton of value and where, you know, I, I think they're still going to be very much part of the conversation is I look at like a Joel Embiid for an example, where he is, when he is healthy, he is as dominant as they come. He is yeah. like, you know, one of the best pure shooters in the game. Uh, defensively, he's one of the best in the game. You know, like just, you know, in the post, you can't touch him. Like he, he, he the only way you stop him is is praying he, he doesn't score. And even mm -hmm. then God's laughing at you because that's just what he does. He scores. Right. But right. like, it, it, but it's each and every time, each and every year, it's you pray that he gets to this part of the year healthy. And I was even thinking about this earlier today with Wimby. It's like, you know, if I'm the Spurs on one hand, you feel like, yeah, we have a, we have a runway as long as this guy's healthy. But the yeah. question is with Wimby, how long is he healthy? And if he does get injured, what's the recovery like, like on that? Because operating an, on an ACL on like a Quentin Grimes or even like a Derrick Rose is not the same thing as performing that type of surgery on a Victor Wimbanyama, your body sure. and what you're carrying on you. Like, like that's why big guys deal with so many injuries is because what they are actually like, you know, carrying on a day to day basis is not how the human body was designed. Right. Like it is genetically not. No, Um. no, it's not. And that's like something to keep an eye out for. Like, obviously right. like even the number one seed in the West, the thunder have Chet. Yep he's been healthy this year, but like last year he was injured. Right. Yeah. But I think my, my question overall is like, is the value, I should phrase it like this. Should your top priority, if you're trying to build a championship team, be having that great big and then a wing, you know what I mean? Like right. is, is your priority a big first and then a wing? Cause I'm, I'm looking and I'm thinking and I'm like, Okay, we're talking about the president of basketball operations for the Pistons. And obviously, the Pistons are a storied team. And there's 
any NBA team, when they're starting from scratch, the end goal is a championship. Yep. And if your end goal is a championship and your pillar is Cade Cunningham, who I believe it will be a multi-time all-star, all-NBA, et cetera, do you believe in Jalen Duran to be that big for him? Yep. You know, or is that big even, you know, like, is that big on this team yet? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I, I really am wondering that question. Cause I think Duran's super talented and I think he's still super young and has a whole lot to learn. Yep. But I don't know if he's like a playoff difference maker. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, my biggest concern with his development, I love Duran's game and, and a lot of what he's doing. And offensively, I think he's taken a lot of strides. I think a lot of guys, especially bigs, you know, like they very early get very hyper-focused on, you know, developing their offensive game. And don't get me wrong. If you can develop on that end and be a true difference maker, you can really get yourself paid. You can make a massive difference. But like, it feels to me that like, for Jalen Dern to be the player that we all think he can be, he has to take that step on the on the defensive end first because he's already doing certain things extremely dominant. Like he doesn't have to do much. Like he can go out and be a rim runner and and just you know get putbacks at the rim and still get you eighteen to twenty on a given night. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's yeah. like when when you are that naturally athletic and gifted and can do a lot of those things in a certain aspect, there almost isn't a ton else that you need to add on to your game on the offensive side of my opinion. So for me, like with him, it's like, you know, if he can become that, you know, that guy on the other side of the ball, I think we're looking at him as like a, like a bam out of bio type of like, you know, like an absolute, like that is a, a pillar center that you'd have next to your star. But it's like, yeah. you know, like it was just in, and granted you, you expect, you expect it to a certain extent because he's 20 years old. Like he's still like, he's still a kid, but like right. there's just those times where, you know, he just looks like a deer in the headlights. And, you know, again, like, the offensive development's great to see, but it's almost like, you know, are you missing the forest of the trees in the sense? That makes sense. Absolutely. And I, I just, I'll, I'll, I'll end here for this. If you, let's play a hypothetical. Yep. Let's say the Pistons get the number one pick in the draft and you're looking at Alex Sar, big, right? And he's yep. projected one or two, I believe. So you're looking at him and you're thinking franchise big. I know he has his issues with rebounding. I know he could potentially end up being a four, but I don't think you want to start there, right? Let's just say for this hypothetical, you have to choose between one of um, Jalen Duran or Alex Sar. It's we keep the pick and we take Alex Sar, or we keep Jalen Duran and we trade the pick for like whatever, you know, that's going to help build this team. What do you believe in more if you're really trying to build a championship contender? I think if you're really trying to build a championship contender, and I know Pistons fans are probably not gonna gonna want to hear this, um, you know, a, as of today, you know, just based off of like what like Alex Sar could be, I think you roll the dice on that and you see where you can go with it. But I mean, again, you know, there is so much to like with Jalen Duran's game that you know when and especially you look at the amount of guys the Pistons got like the the Pistons have traded perhaps too soon. And have eventually blossomed into guy into guys that you know were beyond even what you would expect in Detroit. Like yeah. he he is like at the top of the list of guys that you would fear would become that, right? Yeah. But at the same time, if you get a, a guy who can who 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 has certain skills that are more ready now, who has things like the three point shot and has more of the capability to stretch the floor, I mean, that's just a that's an element to the pick and roll with Cade that just makes it that much more dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think I'm with you. And that's, this is coming from me. Who's like very high on Jalen Duran. I'm a very biased towards Jalen Duran guy. Myself. Yeah. It's hard I, to say. I think the tools are there, but it's such an if right now, yep. like obviously the stats are there, but I feel like the impact on the game quite isn't there yet. Yep. It, it, and it absolutely could be because it, it was in the beginning of the season, right? Like it's such a up in the air thing. But in my opinion, you look at one of the things that have changed, uh, like the one of the most obvious things that were different from the first three to four games to when the losing streak started, it was Jalen Duran's effect on the game. Mm -hmm. because, Specifically on defense. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And that, that impact on defense kind of just went down as the season continued. And maybe that's because of 
ankle injuries and like trying to avoid those or whatever it is. But if I'm the Pistons and I, you don't have to pick between one or the other, obviously. Right. But just and pure hypothetical, if you had to, I might go SAR and I, I might go SAR strictly because I think he has the ability to be that franchise big that yep. makes like that difference. And then you have that with Cade and then you already have like, you know what I mean? Cause that's, that's what we've been, that's what they've been looking for this whole time is 100%. Can we, yeah. So I, I think that's, that's, that's the route. I think that's kind of something that my philosophy changed on. Cause I've, I've never really thought about, what a real franchise and i'm not just talking like i guess there's like a tier b tier c tier and like s tier right Mm -hmm. i'm talking like an s tier big you know i think that really makes a difference yeah i think the i think people way overcorrected when um with like the small ball era and just essentially thought the big man position was going to die when in reality i think the people who are paying attention to the game knew that like they were eventually going to adapt and when they do they were going to be just as dangerous as ever. And now, you know, I don't see a future where the big isn't dominant in this game because if, if they can shoot the three and, and I mean, especially with, with the wrinkles that Jokic has brought to it. I yeah. mean, that's like, that's almost like the final evolution right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. No doubt. Just scary stuff. But so I could literally do this for hours with you, man. This has been so fun. Thank you so much for, for sitting through here and you know this will be cut but going through one of the most unique podcast <laughs> experiences i've ever gone through in my entire life but seriously uh if you haven't if you haven't followed czar and all the awesome work that he does go go follow him over on x and on and on instagram and, and are you on threads as well no i probably should be at some point i just yeah i mean elon's gonna burn down x at some point you know we'll we'll get our backups out there eventually yeah, let me start on that one. oh yeah. yeah that's a whole other pod in itself <laughs> yeah um but i appreciate you having me on here once again it's 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 always a pleasure i'm always going to be a number one from have court supporter um i'm really proud of the stuff you've been doing man hey same to you man it's been really cool to be able to be in the room together this year and, you know, I'm just excited to, you know, to be covering the team for years to come and, you know, hopefully to be, you know, right alongside you in that room, man. It's going to be fun. But Looking forward to it. Same here, brother. But thank you all to, you know, for listening to this episode of we'll catch you guys next time from half court. Be sure you subscribe.